and come to um, all of our events, which are open and um, um, also recorded. Most of them are recorded, so you can go back um, to them online and listen at a later point in time uh, if you would like to go back over something that you missed. You can find it through our um, events on the Harmon website. So welcome again to a talk today um, entitled War, Hope, and Ukraine's Global Significance, Insights from Dozer Kazimara. He is, uh, he is, I'm going to give you a, a short bio, and then I'm going to turn over the floor. Um, he is a journalist, a reporter, and a war correspondent for the Polish outlet Radio 357 and on PL. Um, and has been actively engaged in covering the war in Ukraine. Since 2016, he was among the first Western journalists to cross the border between Ukraine and the unrecognized pro-Russian entity known as the Donetsk People's Republic. Through numerous radio and television productions, as well as written articles, has worn shed light on the complexities of the conflict and continue to visit the front lines in Donbass. In 2022, as the conflict escalated, he transitioned from journalism to humanitarian efforts and founded the UA Future Foundation, which is involved in actively saving lives on the front lines. The foundation provides food to the res provided food to the residents of Bakhmut until January 2023, and volunteers have continued their efforts in places like Avdivka, Arkiv, Izum, and Kherson. Aside from supporting thousands of civilians, UA Future, in collaboration with international partners, supplies essential medical resources to civilian hospitals and stabilization points closer to the front. The foundation actively supports Polish and American volunteer groups with life-saving equipment. And we are very lucky uh, today to have the vice president of the foundation, Jeff Hoffman, um, who will also say a few words to you um, today. So the format is as follows. We will hear from our speaker, and then afterwards, you'll have a question and answer um, period. And just please, if you have a question, introduce yourself um, before you pose your question so we can know who's in the audience. And thanks again for your attention. Piotr? Hello. I'm very happy uh, to see you. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have, that's the question. Uh, we have the second, or we have the 10th anniversary uh, of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and in my opinion, we have 10th uh, anniversary of this war, unfortunately. And it takes much, much longer than uh, everyone thought uh, as we begin. Uh, I wanted to thank you uh, for uh, your appearance, uh, because this topic is very important, but I know there is also a couple of people from Ukraine who are watching us uh, online, uh, and we are here because they cannot, because they cannot leave the country. Most of the soldiers, for example, who could tell you all these stories way better than we they need to stay there and they need to live in the trenches. I say live in the trenches because actually we are living uh, in there for the last two years. Uh, and every winter they need to stay there, they cannot go out. And uh, that's what we are trying to do to be their voice. So <laughs> here we are actually. Mm. And uh, I'm very happy to be in New York and talk about it. Uh, because two years ago, I never thought um, that the war will start, actually. Uh, in 2016, when my story with Ukraine started, I also didn't think that this war will be that important for Poland or the rest of the world as we all see it is now. Uh, and I didn't think that this war is that terrible as everyone was uh, talking in, saying in TV, in the radio, I've been reading in the newspapers. I didn't want to believe that the Russians are doing that many bad things uh, in Ukraine. So that's why I decided to go to the Russian side uh, in 2016. So it's two years 
after the beginning of the Royal Dogmas to have a look and to check what is going on and what people in Dogmas, people's, people's public will tell me and what I will see uh, over there. And um, when, I, uh, when I first crossed the border with uh, this unrecognized, uh, uh, unrecognized place, I didn't even understand the difference between the Russian and Ukrainian language, you know. For me, it was more or less uh, the same. And uh, I remember when uh, I arrived to the headquarters of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Donetsk People's Republic, and I said, Dobry dzień, that means uh, good morning in Ukrainian. And they said, actually, you shouldn't say Dobry dzień here because you speak in Ukrainian, you should say Zdrastvice in the Russian. And I said, what is the difference? Like, there is Ukraine and here is Ukraine, you are using different languages, but, but probably you speak the language of your own country. So I couldn't, couldn't understand this crack that happened uh, in Ukraine in 2014. Uh, and what I, what I saw, maybe I can show you some pictures, <laughs> then you can, you can see it as well. Change. Yeah, so this is a view from the city center of Donetsk, city occupied by Russia from 2014. And as you see, it doesn't look that bad. Uh, it looks actually quite all right. It's clean, it's not that much uh, destroyed. So um, as soon as I crossed this border, I thought maybe this is actually not that much true as I have been told about this war. But uh, I started to, to go deeper and deeper. And this is one of the last Lenin monuments of uh, in Ukraine, because most of them they've been destroyed from 2014. There's a big movement in Ukraine to uh, put all these uh, monuments down. And then you are arriving to the place like that, you know, and uh, you can you can smell the war. You can see what damages have been done. And then your perspective starts to to change a lot, especially if you go to the front line. And then you see all these houses and people living in the basements, for example. So this this situation we didn't change that much uh, from 2016. And me and Jed, we have seen a lot of destroyed houses here. So uh, for me, these pictures, they start to be almost the same, to be honest. Because if you see one destroyed house or two destroyed houses, then it, it makes uh, an effect. But if you see all destroyed cities, for example, one by one, a few hundred square kilometers uh, of the area in Donbass completely ruined to the ground, you know, you just can't imagine that this is, this is true. And this is still, still in Donetsk, this everything. And uh, I wanted to talk also to the people in Donetsk, if they are really following Russia and they would like, or they would like to be a part of Ukraine. And what I need to say, some of these people, they, they really want to uh, participate to the Russian, Russian world, but not all of them, definitely. And I met a lot of people in Donetsk who have been trying to uh, form some movements to, to be back, for example, to Ukraine. And it was possible uh, in 2016 to do it. I don't think so. It would be possible, possible now, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, this is, for example, a cellar where people are living. <laughs> so this is maybe one kilometer, five hundred, what a kilometer, five hundred meters uh, from the front, from the front line, and uh, this uh, in this area you can really see the damages. This is very 
interesting uh, picture for me because I was a witness of uh, of a Russian propaganda actually happening in Donetsk People's Republic. I don't know if you maybe ever read a book of Jessica Arrow, Putin's Thoughts. No, it's it's very interesting book, and uh, she's writing about the troll farms organized, for example, in Donetsk People's Republic, uh, and they are built out of the journalists from all around the world. And on this picture, for example, you can see a Polish guy, this is David Kudis, and this is American guy, uh, Patrick Lancaster, uh, two propagandists, that's what we need to say, because their main job is to, like, they build Mm, kind of a uh, press agency called Sudoni Press, and they employed journalists from different countries like Italy, Spain, France, Poland, uh, Great Britain, America, to share the propaganda that they, they want to share with us. And uh, it's very interesting because you have uh, two people who organize this Sudoni Press agency, one of them is Janusz Putkon, and, and the second one is Paul Bachmann. And these both guys, they are from Finland, <laughs> uh, living in Donetsk People's Republic. And uh, Paul Bachmann is uh, called by many, many people as a, a right hand of Putin's propaganda in the West. And I met him personally. He was organizing uh, my interview with Alexander Zakharchenko, uh, the former president of this unrecognized uh, country. Uh, and it never happened, actually, because they told me, like, you don't have to ask any questions. There will be a screen, and we will write you all the questions, even in Polish. So you, you, you just can read it. Don't worry. And I said, uh, we're not going to work like that. Uh, I don't want to do interview with Mr. Zakharchenko on your way. If you want me to interview uh, him, then we need to do it in uh, normal conditions, uh, but at the end it didn't work out because they didn't uh, approve my ID and I had to escape actually from the People's Republic. So they told me like the car will come for you and pick you up at nine o'clock if you want or not. And I said, okay, I'm waiting. And then at seven o'clock, I was already waiting at the bus station, you know, <laughs> taking a random bus just to go to, the, to Ukraine and uh, we crossed the border uh, the front line with some Ukrainian people also trying to escape from people's uh, from Manus people's republic and we've been going through the through the minefield uh, to do it. So this is a very unique picture of um, airport in Donetsk. I made it from the Russian snipers' positions uh, for two packs of cigarettes. Which is also funny because I've been uh, I've been waiting downstairs and trying to shoot some pictures and then someone started to shout uh, from the top floor saying that stop stop and um, trying to to shout to me you know and then I I, I just freeze uh, and a second soldier came came downstairs and he asked. Who I am, what I'm doing here. I say, I said, I'm a journalist from Poland. I know I'm stupid that I came here, uh, but I just wanted to make a picture of the of the uh, airport. And uh, I started to smoke cigarette, and he asked me also, uh, can I give him one cigarette? I said, yeah, actually, I can give you a full pack. Don't worry, you know. And he said, okay, so come with me, and uh, I will show you the greatest place from where you can you can look the picture, and that's it. The story, <laughs> actually, of this uh, this photograph. Uh, yes, this is the Zaharchenko. He is dead right now. He died in two thousand eighteen uh, by the bomb in the restaurant in the center of in Donetsk. And even until now, we don't really know who killed him because Al Azov was saying that they've been. Uh, organizing this, they wanted to, to, to kill him. Uh, 
but maybe there was also the, there is a speculation maybe it was the internal war in Donetsk People's Republic because uh, some people they had more power and they wanted to gain more uh, mines for example or industry or some other businesses and they started to fight each other with this guy actually and uh, his name is Arsen Pavlov, a Motorola mm, Russian missionary Mm, who also got killed in the Donetsk People's Republic and he was responsible for murdering a lot of Ukrainian soldiers, for example, in, uh, uh, in, in the, at the airport, in the cyborgs, probably you have heard about them, so that's the guy who was responsible for killing a lot of war prisoners. Uh, and that was the parade uh, of the day of the victory and about that what I said at the beginning if everyone is following Russia and Donetsk People's Republic not really because I went after this um, parade I went to the shop and I wanted to buy something and then I noticed that the, the lady uh, is watching the parade so I thought that she's watching the parade in Donetsk so I, I wanted to see it and I went uh, under to the shop and she she was just terrified that I have seen what is on her screen because she was watching the parade from TV. You know, so some people, they just have no other opportunity and they need to stay in the circumstances as they have been put in. Yeah, and uh, also on this parade, you have uh, like a second parade showing uh, all of the victims of the Second World War, uh, or as they call it, the Great uh, Patriotic War. So, from 2016 to 2022, we uh, had six years. So, so, from 2016, I've been trying to explain to everyone why we should support Ukraine, that this war is very important. But to be honest, there was no in, not much people interested in Ukraine in general. It was even very hard to publish any article in the radio or in the newspaper. People that no one seriously didn't want to publish it. Like I spent two years going to the front line. I was in the Donald People's Republic interviewing mm -hmm. the families of the children who got killed in the war. And then I went on the Ukrainian side. I've been speaking to the soldiers uh, who probably have been shooting uh, in this place because it's a war, and uh, I put together the reportage of my two years' work, uh, and I couldn't publish it for the next two years, you know. <laughs> so when the war started, it started again in 2022, I was mm, very unhappy because everyone was asking me about Ukraine and saying, like, please explain what is, what is going on. And I said, like, you can read my articles, I have been writing about it for the last six years. Uh, now I'm pretty busy uh, <laughs> and I don't want to be a journalist anymore. And a lot of my friends, they started to call me who I met in the last six years to evacuate their family, a mother, a wife, a children, a dog or whatever, uh, because they've been going to fight. Uh, they've been going to join the army uh, and to fight. So. Actually, I arrived, I came to Ukraine to be a journalist, but I just started to receive a lot of phone calls from my friends to evacuate their, their family. And that's how it all uh, started. At the beginning, in the first two weeks, we evacuated over 30 people from the cities like Kharkiv, Kiev, uh, as well, Kapivnitsky, uh, Kherson, in Karamatorsk and many others, and uh, Odessa as well, Kotovsky. Uh, this is Miss Ludmila. She was one of the um, first persons that I evacuated. Uh, she was over 70 years old, uh, living in Kotovsky, about 50 kilometers, maybe, from uh, Odessa. 
and no one wanted to take her out from the country because she had three dogs. <laughs> you see, so I was I was the one, and also it was very dangerous to go to Odessa at the beginning of the war because no one knew where the the Russian army will go and which road they will take. So that's why I decided to go through uh, along the Moldovian border, which was the terror. The, 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 the worst idea ever because uh, there is no roads. <laughs> so I've been driving whole day almost, but uh, finally I got to pick up this Miss Ludmila and I was very surprised because it was the beginning of the war and uh, you know, the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was. <laughs> Uh, this one was my favorite, but <laughs> she wanted to bite me all the time, like the whole way. <laughs> and uh, I was very surprised because uh, I started to speak in Ukrainian to the people in Kotovsk, and they didn't want to respond in Ukraine, and then they, they actually got nervous that I'm speaking Ukrainian. And uh, that's why Ms. Ludmila uh, decided to leave the city, because uh, she was half uh, Ukrainian, half uh, German, and her father was a member of the UPA, the, how do you say it? Um, uh, Ukrainian Insurgent Army. Uh, so he was one of these uh, famous bandits, uh, how they call them. And the second thing, her mother was German, you know, so uh, she was living in Kotowski for a whole her, her life. Uh, and at the beginning of the war, someone knocked to her doors, uh, and it was her friend that she knew for all her life, you know. And uh, she just, uh, she just, just spit on her, and, and she said, Putin is coming after you, and he's coming uh, after all of it you Nazis and bandits. And she got really, really afraid. And uh, she called her daughter living in Germany. Then her daughter called to my friend from my uh, my high school. And that's uh, how I decided to, to go there. And the, the roads have been completely empty. Uh, but but we made it finally. And we've been even sleeping in the castle. She, we didn't want to believe that we would sleep in the castle because there is a castle of Kościuszko uh, near in Nisa, and it was revealed to be a refugee house at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the war. And uh, unfortunately, we never met again with Muslimiva uh, because she died in, in Germany on cancer a few months ago. So that was the last time for her to be in, in her country, but at least she spent the last couple of months of her life in normal conditions. Uh, and from there, uh, we decided to go to Kiev and evacuate people from Kiev because Kiev was under the siege. We started to destroy the damages in Kramatorsk. Uh, but yeah, when when I uh, evacuated Mr. Miwa, we decided to go to Kiev to also evacuate the family you know, of one of my friends. And uh, we've been sleeping maybe three kilometers, which is about two miles, yeah, maybe less, even uh, from Bucha and, and from Irpin. And uh, later on, we just realized that actually we've been in Kiev during the worst days. Uh, of Pucha and Irpin, and uh, until today I'm thinking that probably when I have been sleeping just a couple of kilometers further uh, in Pucha, a lot of people got murdered, raped, you know, and a lot of terrible things happened. Uh, Later, we, we went obviously to Bucha and to Irpin to support people with, uh, with water, with food, with clothing, with everything because they had, they had nothing. There were no electricity for a long time. 
Yes. Uh, and from here, we decide to go to Donbass because we can go further and further uh, to the to the front lines. Uh, at the beginning, we um, arrived to the city of Paravinkova. It was the 9th of uh, the 9th of May, um, 2022. So also a victory day, and uh, we didn't know what can what can happen. And, uh, but fortunately, it was not um, not that not that bad uh, day, and that's as you see how we provide food. This is uh, this picture is made in Rai Alexandrivka in Donbas, uh, not very far from the front line, about ten kilometers away. So we need to wear bulletproof jackets. We actually should wear also helmets. Yes, <laughs> but. <laughs> And this day we we didn't we didn't do it. Um, yes, and uh, from um, since then we have shifted our efforts almost exclusively um, to the front, and uh, we started um, supporting not only civilians but also soldiers, but only with uh, life saving equipment like sleeping bags, for example, uh, Israeli bandages, tourniquets, and this kind of stuff, or the washing powder, because they also need it sometimes. Uh, and we started to support also the military and uh, hospitals, or as you see, even American flag, yes. all right, to, to Donbass. These are our friends from the 30th Brigade, we are supporting them until now. And these are the medics uh, evacuating from uh, evacuating wounded soldiers from uh, the front line. This is Katia from the Polish group in the Czech run by Damian Duda. Also, if you want to support some combat medics, Damian Duda is probably the best uh, to be supported. <clears throat> And you can see in whole Donbass uh, this kind of signs uh, of of the Russian army because uh, obviously it's the it's, it's the symbol when they leave, and also that's the view that they leave behind them. Unfortunately, this picture is made uh, in easier. Oh, well, here you can see that we are supporting. This is a hospital in Kramatorsk. So we delivered them uh, a lot of medical supply, supplies. And as you see, it's not always very sad <laughs> because we need to leave somehow. Yeah, even if it's, it's a war, we are trying to make jokes sometimes, to laugh. Here, uh, it's a picture from uh, Kharkiv. We've been delivering Christmas gifts to the... Um, uh, let's say the cancer clinic. Yeah, the cancer clinic for the children. Uh, in Kharkiv, this is also Kramatos, one of the first rockets actually uh, landed in the in the city at the beginning of the full scale invasion in uh, 2022. And this is our uh, friend from 2000 uh, from. 128 brigade, uh, Miss Oksana. Uh, she's a doctor, and they are trying to help as many people as is possible. We are also supporting them. All this equipment you see here comes from our NGO. Actually, we can say we built this hospital uh, for them. Uh, and uh, in the times of counteroffensive, Near Zaporizhia, they this hospital had about thirty-five to fifty wounded people every single day, and it was a very small hospital. Uh, in Varihiv, there was another one, and they had between two hundred fifty and three hundred fifty wounded people every day. In Kulaipola, we had another hospital, and they had another 300 every day. And in Zaporizhia, they had another 300. So it was a few thousand wounded people probably every day and, and killed people every day. Uh, 128 Brigade is the one, maybe you have heard it, 
uh, had you have heard about it in the news um, a lot of artillery uh, specialists got killed because they wanted to give them some orders medals near the front line and unfortunately the Russians they spied it from the drone they hit the place and they killed about 30, 30 soldiers but Oksana is it's a lie uh, this is also the picture that I took at the beginning of the of the war. These are the um, survivors of uh, Mariupol. Uh, they spent um, over a month uh, under the occupation and under the bombings, shellings, living in the shelter. And uh, her husband and her father got. Uh, to the Russian prison, and he is a war prisoner. And this sign says, uh, "I would like, I, I really wait to my father to be back from the uh, from the prison." Uh, I remember that this girl was crying later. And this this is one. This is the train, civilian train, that got bombed in Chaplin near uh, near Dnipro. Uh, also. In 2022, it was the summer. Uh, a lot of private houses got destroyed as well. This is Kramatorsk. You see, it doesn't really look like a military base. It's just a normal, typical building. This actually was a military, military building. So in this case, I cannot say that Russia the civilian building, for example, because it was the Secret Service building in, in Kramatorsk. Uh, but here you can see uh, what damages they do uh, to the civilian buildings here. Obviously, you see, it was a school. Uh, but sometimes uh, we also need to say it because it's true, but sometimes the Ukrainians and Russians as well, uh, they've been making their uh, base, um, the headquarters, for example, in the schools. Uh, and everyone who was uh, in the war, at the war, they know that this is like a normal practice uh, for the war. But now it's forbidden. Uh, over For over a year, it's forbidden for the army to stay in these kind of civilian buildings, uh, for example. I would somebody just interject when we, when we make that statement because that, that came out in the news a few a few months ago criticism from Amnesty International in Ukraine was stationing troops in schools and the reality is there's one very important fact that they didn't highlight these schools are not in session right there are no kids in these schools so and, and to be honest with you from what we witnessed multiple times Russia will strike schools no matter what so there may not be in fact any you know clearly there's no school in session maybe a military presence maybe not they'll still hit it so we've seen that we've seen that all over the place. We'll get more to that later. But we'll yeah. 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 yeah, but the ch children they don't go to school till now. Uh, parents they have opportunity in Ukraine to send the kids to the school, for example, if they really want to. Uh, but in general, there is no um, no no formal yeah, yeah, yeah school school yeah, to the to, to go to school yet. Yeah. In Kiev, for example, some of the schools they. They do it in uh, two ways. So the, some of the children, they go to school for two weeks and uh, later on they switch, for example, and uh, they have online lessons because it's up to the amount of places in the shelters um, for children that they have in the school. So you see how ridiculous it is. Like you cannot um, send the, your kids to the school if there is no place in the shelter. Can you imagine something like that in New York and Warsaw? It's just crazy. This is Mr. Andre, a very great guy. I call him the angel of ESU, also very important uh, city in this war and very much destroyed. Mr. Andre saved over 60 lives uh, in his cellar because uh, there were people living in his, in his cellar for in all occupation, and he was trying to support them with food. He was cooking for them and everything, but unfortunately his house at the end got destroyed. But he survived and everybody in this house survived, except one um, eight years old woman and she died in this cellar. 
but uh, it's it's terrible, but it's also amazing because in the same time when this lady died, there was uh, the the child got born or in the cellar. In the cellar. Yeah. And having been in that cellar, I would tell you that's not a place you'd want to reside for a period of time. So no, this is actually this cellar uh, again. So you see, children, because you see toys, you know. And uh, it was over a year ago, but there is many places like that in Ukraine right now. You know, thousands of people are living in the in the cellars. Uh, like that, with no electricity, with no water, with no toilet. One lady told me a story when she wanted to go to the toilet, the Russian snipers, they started to shoot on her teeth, for example, so she had to run, run back. And uh, this woman, for example, she survived Second World War. And uh, now she's experiencing something very similar, as, as she said. And uh, that was probably one of, of the most terrible experiences for me uh, during this war because I've been uh, like one of the first journalists as well in the world. I've been visiting uh, mass graves in Izium just after uh, they found them, and that was the day of uh, exhumation. Yeah, exhumation. So I still remember this terrible smell of these bodies you know and uh most of these people they got uh killed in the in bombings during the rocket attacks but some of them uh they also um, they've been uh, executed uh as this body for example uh because you cannot see it really on this picture uh but his hands I tied are tied it like that with the Ukrainian flag, you know, blue and and yellow, and his these hands you can uh, see on the twenty hryvnas banknote, for example. So that was really a really terrible day. A few hundred people they found like that, and. Uh, that was the beginning of the process to find out actually uh, what happened to these people. But uh, at least about 50 or 60 died in this house. Uh, and some of the bodies, they've been still under the, uh, the concrete from this house, from this building. Now they are mm, taking this building down. Now, you know, but it was able to, to see it for a long time. It is also easy There's a stone bus, so you can see the traces because this is the one of the liberated uh, villages. So before it was a Z site and now it's a, a ZSU, so Ukrainian army. A lot of destroyed tanks, a lot of destroyed uh, war vehicles and this is probably one of my favorite pictures because it shows how this war stops the circle of life because these all sunflowers, they should be harvested. Uh, uh, but it's impossible because this is a minefield, you know, so you cannot go there, you cannot enter because probably you wouldn't be dead. And uh, I always imagine, you know, this picture as a, uh, flag of Ukraine, so you should be nice blue color, you know, and here we should have nice yellow color, but unfortunately how Ukraine looks like that right now. Uh, and like that, and like that, here were about 50 or 60 people have been living and they, they are all gone. Say. Yeah, this is Orihiv. Maybe you can say something about Orihiv. Orihiv is, is a uh, city of Zaporizhia. We've been there a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're familiar with the geography, uh, Zaporizhia is just south of, uh, of oh my gosh. Thank you. 
I say our desk. That would have been very wrong. And I would have called out this. Um, so essentially, that's the that's the lower portion of the front line. Uh, so the first time we went was April of last year, uh, when it was still kind of an exciting place, but it's got infinitely more so because you saw the recent attempt at counteroffensive. Uh, the push has been to the south. Long term objectives we can discuss in Q and A. I think what the Ukrainians were trying to do, uh, but it is and there's. Great picture of me. Um, essentially, these are areas that have been transformed. These are small cities, industrial base, um, very much Eastern Ukraine, which tends to be <laughs> poor. Um, there it is. Um, and, and essentially, you know, the war, what the war has done is transformed what I've always been asked to kind of describe it or comment on it. It's that the war has transformed poor communities into even worse communities. And this is essentially for the purposes of expanding an empire. So, or it or, or gets very interesting. Um, there's a picture coming up, which I would describe as the probably most intense two minutes of my life, which is when we were dropping food at a location that was specifically repeatedly targeted by Russian artillery. And you kind of hear the drones overhead, and that's a, a sound that'll make you a little bit nervous. But, um, you know, these are the people we're, we're interacting with. And, um, yeah, please, there. I call that the call that uh, that expression on my face is absolutely terrified. So, um, but this is this is what you know the foundation's been doing in that regard, partnering uh, with other organizations. And these people have nowhere to go. They have absolutely nowhere to go. So this is this is not United States level of poverty where you could relocate uh, from Alabama and move closer to the city and find employment. This is nothing like that. It's completely outside of our frame of reference. So. That's the importance of it. Yeah, a lot of people is actually asking me like why why civilians they don't want to go somewhere, you know, be live in the safe uh areas. Try to imagine if your salary is about fifty dollars a month and you need to pay uh for a ticket to get to the west that are in Ukraine, you need to pay about forty. So you have ten dollars actually for the everything you you need for the rest of your life probably. So the salaries that's one um, one thing, but also a lot of people who stay there you can notice you know they are about seventy, eighty, sometimes ninety. Even once we met uh, a woman who is hundred years old, uh, it's impossible for them. Uh, to escape and to find themselves in a, in a different cities because most of them they don't speak any other uh, language than Surzhik actually because they don't speak Ukrainian and they don't speak here uh, Russian but they speak Surzhik so they, they just cannot imagine to move anywhere to Paris you know most of Amsterdam it's like in something completely out of the uh, minds mm -hmm. to be done. But unfortunately, also, we have to say that some of them, they are just waiting for Russia, supporting Russia. Uh, it happened a lot in Abdiivka, uh, the city that just collapsed a few days ago. We've been there also in a uh, few times. I was there. I don't know how many times, but probably over 50. Uh, this is in Bakhmut, for example. And uh, in Bakhmut was totally ruined by the Russians and almost every single person has been living there got killed. So we didn't see uh, any interviews, for example, with the survivors of Bakhmut, but we can see and we can watch some interviews made by the Russian TV, for example, with the survivors of Avdiivka. And now we see why actually these people have been staying there. But still, you know, the percentage of these people supporting Russia and people supporting Ukraine, it's it's massive because um, Avdiivka uh, was about uh, 40,000 people before the war. And only about 1,500 they decide to, to, to stay, you know, so still over 38,000 people decide to run away and they, and they didn't wait for, you know, for Russia. So it's very, like in my opinion, it's very much propaganda to say that 
they think they want to join um, Russia. It doesn't look like that. This is also a picture made in Bakhmut, like very important for me because I very much remember these people. They gave me a small piece of paper uh, with their phone number and uh, they wrote one very short sentence to their uh, to their daughter saying like we are all right we are alive alive don't worry uh, and they asked me to call the daughter um, and tell her that they are okay and I said like but what why don't you want to leave why you are living in the shelter and waiting for humanitarian aid and you have no water no electricity like not, nothing. And they said, this is our place. No one needs us uh, anywhere, so we will we will stay. And this sentence is, uh, people are repeating constantly that no one needs us. They have this strong feeling. And you see how many people have been there waiting for supplies in Bakhmut. But uh, this area doesn't exist anymore. I don't know. Put number to all these people as well. This is one of the pictures made in Slavic. Uh, also, this, this lady you see, in, in the almost whole building was destroyed, but uh, she was living not in her apartment, but in her friend's apartment because her apartment got burned. Uh, so she had to move, and she was about 90 years old, no family, no money nothing so what to do <laughs> go to amsterdam go to warsaw in poland and what what next so a lot of people also they decide to uh, run away from bakhmut but later on uh, they notice that they have nothing to do and they decide to back to their home uh, this is uh, a picture uh, made you know slavisk uh, this is what it was that's in Bakhmut as well. Uh, probably it's from the tank. Yeah. And uh, a year ago, uh, we organized the uh, first edition of the action that we are trying to, to do every year. It uh, calls um, presents, gifts instead of bombs. Uh, and I've been told that there is no children in Bakhmut. So I should. I shouldn't take that many Christmas gifts with me because there will be no children uh, to give it to them. And we found about 53 children, you know, uh, small like that, and even newborn child, uh, like two weeks old, you know, child. Uh, and they didn't want to leave, unfortunately. These two girls, mm, when there was an uh, incoming, uh, they completely didn't care about the income, the sharing, these good sounds. They've been just telling me a story about their dog, you know. So there was a missile coming and they've been talking about their dog. And that's how people cook, for example. Uh, so they build these kind of things uh, and they cook together. Someone has uh, grain, someone has this, one has that, and they cook soup and uh, that's how they survive. And uh, this is very important that probably this lady had a typical normal life as we all had. She, she, she has been working to the job, she had a family, she had friends, but now she's living in this kind of circumstances. And this is Baba Vala, the grandma of Vala. Uh, we evacuated her from Siedersk in Donetsk, when it, uh, the Donetsk region, when Siedersk was under uh, the attack, very heavy attacks, and she didn't want to leave her house as well, because she is about 80 years old. Uh, but her neighbor got burned in the, ha in the house just next door, and uh, then she got terrified, and she called us, and she asked her, can you come and pick me up? And I said, like, listen, but there is a real fights right now like we've been calling you for a couple of months to leave and you are deciding to to run away today like, okay we will come and so we went there and uh, we picked her uh, up and it was the last minute uh, to do it because she already had uh sleeping pills you know 
and she wanted to kill herself. She wanted to commit a suicide this night. So we took her away in the last last moment, and she wanted me to drive her to Donetsk People's Republic to the Russian occupied area because she was a Russian speaker as well, and she felt that the Russians are not bad. And her son is living also uh, in the People's Republic. But fortunately, we didn't uh, manage to do it. Uh, and we took her to Tarnopil, to the Western Ukraine. She was terrified, probably more than these missiles, because she thought that we are taking her to the boundaries, you know, on the Western Ukraine. And then we arrived to Tarnopil. She met Sister Julia. And Sister Julia is actually helping her a lot. Until now, because um, the grandma Vala is still living in the monastery uh, run by three Polish nuns. Uh, they also run the orphan house uh, in Tarnopil, and we try to support all these children. And this is at the uh, one of the buildings that I don't know if it exists um, today, but this building doesn't exist, definitely it was destroyed uh, before, but I have seen some pictures uh, from a few, few days ago and it doesn't exist anymore. Empty, completely empty town, and Jeff, actually, you, you've been watching the Aviv from before the war, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I uh, will get that. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. That's also the cellar where people are living. These are the soldiers also living in the cellars for many, many times. Buildings like that, it was a very cozy town before the war, but unfortunately it got destroyed. This, it was my first time in Apivka. It was completely crazy because I didn't know the way, how to get there. So I've been driving between the Russian and Ukrainian positions. So Russians got in here, Ukrainians here, and finally that I was in the middle driving and listening to Bob Marley, actually. <laughs> the sun is shining. And uh, <laughs> we we arrived to Avdivka, we met these people, and this lady, she told me uh, her life story, and she said that her husband got killed, and she just buried him behind the house, in the garden. So I left them some of potatoes. The potatoes actually have I received from an Ukrainian guy. And this is a moonshine, very important thing, because you can pay, you know, because the money is nothing uh, during the war. But for moonshine, you can get a lot of things, especially that alcohol is forbidden and prohibited. Uh, that was our car. Some children that we are trying to give them a good memories. That was my, my goal to organize this action because I have heard from uh, many Polish people, for example, uh, the stories from the Second World War that there was a German guy who gave him a bar of chocolate, for example, and it was like very good memory uh, for him. And I saw, I noticed that some of the people who had who have these this kind of good memories from the war, they actually can deal better with their past than the people who has nothing good to say. And that's that's why we decided to organize this action. The gifts make me instead of bombs, uh, go to the front line. And I really hope that these children, you know, maybe they're not gonna be that much uh, traumatized, but definitely the whole nation, whole Ukrainian nation will be traumatized for a couple of generations. Even some of these children are actually these children, they've been living under the occupation as well. Uh, they don't want to talk about it too much, but some of the children, they don't even uh, have, mm, they, they haven't seen a rocket, for example. They haven't heard any explosions but they dream about the you know, drones, for example, killing their friends, for example, you know, so the, the war, even it's not that close, it's still in the people's minds and probably will unfortunately stay there for long. You know, this is picture making 
have signed this Slavyansk and our very good friend, <laughs> you cannot see here his face because uh, he is actually hiding in Slavyansk because he's Russian, uh, a philosopher and a professor from Tomsk in uh, Siberia. And uh, he was a Russian oppositionist and in 2015 he was organizing um, anti-war protests, anti-war yeah, protests, uh, and a lot of his friends got killed and he managed to escape to Ukraine and he's living in Ukraine, searched by FSB and hiding. Very smart guy. Mr. Nikolai Karpinski, if you want to search for him, it's very worth to read his articles. All right, just jump in. I know you wanted some time for Q and A, am I correct? Or do we have? Are we yeah. on that? Um. So yeah, usually we have probably about half an hour. Left. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, we switch it over because yeah, I know this is these are obviously pictures that also identify when your these shots are taken. Where they are. Uh, uh that uh, one is uh, I, uh, general uh, as I, Yeah. Thank you. Uh, April of last year. Yeah. This is Orihid. This is Kulaipola. This is Slavic. Yeah. But this is this is Abdiv. Yes, so many questions, yeah. Because yeah. I can talk to you. I was gonna say just for two minutes because I know one of the things we're talking about is why does all this still matter? Right? We're coming up on the second anniversary, the twenty fourth and uh, he's got more pictures of human misery. Um, I have more than I ever wanted, you know, in my iPhone in my life. These experiences, well, why does it still matter? Because uh, we've been talking about, you know, what these conditions that existed prior to February twenty fourth, twenty twenty two, the split in the country. Um, what you're seeing here is the is the uh, for for one of a better term, as simplistic as it sounds, it's the front line liberal democracy that which we live in. Um, and while there always are in any any you know any population there are those who will trend towards authoritarianism. Most people want to live under the system that we have. So why does this still matter? Is that we're there, um, you know, talking to people. Never mind the soft diplomacy that we're trying to practice. It's you know repeated exposure to a country that wishes to gravitate towards our way of life. As as complicated as as, as messy as it, as it is, even in the United States right now. So why does Ukraine matter? That is the front line right now. And will remain such. And we've you know seen the back and forth on the, the aid package, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, it's a relatively simple, simple uh, statement. <clears throat> Why would we want to turn our back on people who wish to be friends with us and people who wish to engage with us and will not threaten our interests? And why would we want to uh, basically placate an enemy that truly does honestly wish to see us burn from the inside out? So essentially, that's what I think one of the messages we get across. Just why does this matter? So why do we? Why do I need to? Why does he continue to do it? So, anyway. Thank you. Um, please, guests at home and in the audience, please just introduce yourself before you pose your question. So, oh, my name is Jack John. I'm a visiting uh, scholar at the Hamilton. I just want to talk about you know uh, the Baltics are next, Moldova. Um, <laughs> From what you think, um, is it possible that the Russians would actually take on another front? Uh, knowing, you know, after two years of this and the uh, exhaustion that must be coming from their side and the demands on their military? What have you been thinking about the war in Ukraine on the 23rd of February? I'm, I'm, I'm just part I'm, of I'm, I'm just answering. <laughs> yeah. Let me go. Let me see. Yeah, right coming up. It's fine. I'm, I'm just know. answering for your question. Uh, yeah. A question, like, what have you been thinking about war in Ukraine on the twenty third of February, two thousand twenty two? We didn't think it was possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so th that's interesting, right? Um, but threats aren't always immediate. They're not always imminent. Um, I think repeatedly has been demonstrated in the history of Ukraine time and time again, is that you you can make a deal with Vladimir Putin. He will break it. And it will, in fact, be a chance to regroup. I mean, they are moving their economy. They are still getting uh, plenty of hard currency coming into oil. 
um, and that economy is rapidly shifting towards arms production. There's certainly uh, plumbing other adversaries that we have, such as Iran, North Korea, et cetera, et cetera. The, the means to do it are out there. And unfortunately, one thing that Russia does have a very plentiful amount, poorly equipped, poorly trained or not, is, is human capital to point out of these things. So no, I don't think if we, um, I wouldn't think in a hypothetical, if Ukraine collapsed tomorrow, that Poland or the Baltics are at risk. But do I think they will be in five years? Absolutely. So that is coming. That is the intention. But do you think they can reconstitute their? Yes, uh, I do think so. Yeah, five years. Yes, yeah. I think um, <clears throat> any any country, if it sets itself on a path and it's slowly becoming something akin to North Korea, uh, can can turn its economy towards nothing but war material production. And you do have a hyper patriotism, the likes of which wouldn't make any sense to us in Russia. You know, we we look at it and we comprehend it that will continue to drive that. that. So yeah, I think I think it can happen. And I would just add really quickly that if we if we understand the internal dynamics of how Russia's political system is changing and the, the forms, the new forms of um, political, well, not just repression, but even accountability to uh, among the political elite, we could see that it may be that the leader, even if it's not Putin, needs war uh, to justify continued power, and that could be a very dangerous thing yep. for other countries going forward. Not that that's determined, but it's already changing in a, in a very negative direction that could um, demand the, the repetition of war um, to sort of remain a legitimate government. Yes. Yes, uh, my name is Jim Dingman. I'm a journalist, and I've been coordinating coverage for a network since that bad 21. Okay. So I've been following this pretty closely, unfortunately, for several years. Um, the Soviets, by the you know, the Russians are at uh, uh, 24 hour production right now in terms of war material. Uh, six to seven percent of their GDP is going to defense budget. So, whatever, I mean, again, just to, to that gentleman's question, and I've been following very close to the military stuff, which is not going to be my question to you guys, but they are very clearly amping up. They are, you know, learning. They're they're adapting, and so we've been watching this very carefully now for the past few years. It's very powerful to watch your guys, your observations. Uh, first, I just was curious when we were talking about the casualties two thousand a day, as that for CIA area in the hospital. You were talking about there's receiving civilian casualties, military casualties. What period of time you're talking about in the time of the offensive? June of last year, or talking about before that? I've been talking specific, specifically about the time of the counteroffensive during the in, in, in June of last year. Last year, okay. yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. Most of time? the people they've been, uh, it was military. Okay. And when's the last time you guys were in Ukraine? Last time? Yeah. Two weeks ago. Okay. October. So what, what, what's the move? What's the move? What's the morale? How are they processing? These debates that are going on in the United States, uh, which we, you know, all of us Americans are quite aware of, and, and the crazy kind of inter uh, conglomeration of our presidential politics. How's that permeating the, to the average person? I'm going to I'm going to jump in on that. Um, so it's I never thought three years ago I was going to have pen pals on the front line in Ukraine, and as of now we check back and forth via WhatsApp or Signal. Um, so we we've stayed in touch, and it's it's overall there there remains a sense of optimism. All right. Um, you know, it, it's a general sense that we can do this, but there's also a sense of bewilderment. So actually, I took a screenshot because I was wondering if um, we kind of get a similar question. This is from, from Boba. Uh, Vladimir, you saw him in the pictures earlier. He's one of the he's chief medic, the 30th medic, which is around Buffalo. Uh, we, I last saw him in October in Ryle, exactly. Um, but what, what's been kind of painful to me as an American is I'll wake up and I'll look at my messages and they're saying, what is going on? And they're following it very, very closely, understandably, um, to the point where you could have a guy in a trench, you know, looking on his phone and basically trying to track what is going on in U.S. Congress. Um, but, you know, this, this sentence in particular kind of was a difficult one for me to answer. He said, we have always believed that America is a monolith of stability. By now, we have become really afraid for the future, not so much ours as the whole world. Everyone went crazy. And it is kind of, to me, it was a difficult one to answer. And you get kind of tired of saying things like, it's always darkest before the sunrise. Um, because obviously they're living it, but but there's a general sense of, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? 
it's by no means is that to convey like Ukrainians have an expectation that they'll just give us everything we want. But they also recognize fully when I talked before about the front line of liberal democracy, they're very well aware of what their position is. Right now. So what would you add to that? I will say like, it, it's very hard to find uh, a single person in Ukraine who is not believing that Ukraine will win this war. Yeah. Seriously. Uh, even they are terrified and uh, sometimes, and right now, for example, they don't know what will happen. Uh, we supposed to go again with humanitarian aid to Ukraine on the 4th of March. And I'm asking my friends, like, okay, we may be, we're going to come here. And they are mostly answering, like, okay, we can set it like that for today, but in two weeks, I don't know what will happen and if we will be still there. You know, just after Avdivka, uh, they started to hit very much Kramatorsk and Slavyansk, um, for example. So probably these are the cities that they would like to take later, maybe Pokrovsk. Um, a lot of people in Kiev, they've been thinking what will happen uh, in future. Uh, but this is not like they are afraid. They just don't know what can happen, but most of them, they are not planning to escape anymore. So I don't expect, for example, if Russia will decide to attack again on Kiev or on, on Kharkiv, for example, which is very possible, uh, there will be that huge uh, wave of the of the refugees as at the beginning of the war. So, so people are mostly very tired of the war because they just want to have a one normal night about uh, sirens, you know, <laughs> just the one normal night uh, without the missiles, without the communicate communicates about drones coming to your city. Because I work in the radio and uh, once my boss called me and she said, the drones are coming to Kiev. Can you make something about it? And I said, yeah, but they come every day since last year. Like, what's the difference today? And she said, are you trying to tell me that this is not important? I mean, I'm just trying to tell you that this is happening every day and you didn't care about it for last year. So I don't know if it's important or not, but this is happening every day. You know? So that's why people are getting uh, used to it. You know, uh, I, I'm, because I am living in Ukraine. I moved from Poland to Ukraine in the, um, August 2022. Uh, and uh, for me, it's also, you know, okay, normal. Like now I've been in Kherson. Um, I took a few of my friends with me. Uh, and it was very scary for them uh, to hear all these missiles. They didn't want to go to the city, for example, to have a walk. And I said, like, no, it's all right. Like, it's just a missile. <laughs> really, really far away, probably like a kilometer away. <laughs> so it's very far. Uh, so this is the atmosphere in Ukraine, like, um, believing the victory, um, a little bit um, getting used to the situation and just waiting for the end of the war and hope. That's what I would say. Yes. Oh. Sorry. So. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, me. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, my name is uh, Fernando Vesquezpo Santalo. It's very long. Uh, I hail from the land of free healthcare and gun control, so Canada. Um, I am a political organizer there, and uh, I work uh, as a researcher at the University of British Columbia. Um, and, not to do with my political work, but thinking a lot about about the kind of the political atmosphere that we've seen, and we see it in Canada, politicians retweeting Elon Musk all of the time with his budget crazy ideas, with the fact that like he Elon Musk and all of his companies, and 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 I mean the the person who's uh, leading in the polls to be the next president of the United States, are both captured by or like have been turned by by uh, Russian propaganda, mm -hmm. like, how can we have, how can there be a future of liberal democracy, like, if, if we have, like, these internal fronts inside where you have, like, the largest two media sources that Americans consume, TikTok and, and, and X being controlled by pro-Russian entities? 
or pro China or pro Russian entities? Like how can you how can you fight that front? Because your front is very easy to know how we fight it, but this front is kind of so military front being easier to fight than than a That's social right. media front. Well, I would say yeah. more more straightforward what the solution is, right? Like then how do you avoid the Yeah, at times I, I get optimistic because I think that there's kind of a pushback. I don't I don't think social media in and of itself is is a bad thing. Um, but I think you need to be real careful how you use it. Yeah. Um, and if you find yourself building up your level of self-esteem based off of social media activity, then you probably have a problem that's better suited for other than use a solution. But, um, you know, um, I think it's probably something that exists in the national character. I think the only reason why you didn't see that in World War II, for those who would have sided with Hitler or, or whoever else, uh, was largely because there was no social media. Um, I think the problem with social media is kind of amplified. I think it's also very important, that even though we've got high-profile figures like Musk and obviously Donald Trump, who's going to be parroting Russian propaganda, and then it's dangerous to get on Twitter because you take a microscopic view of something, and you see some of these posts that's particularly offensive or insanely stupid, and you begin to, in your mind, on a kind of subconscious level, assume that that's widespread. Um, but one of the expressions I like is Twitter is not the United States, right? It's half of its bots, people repeating things. So, so we always have to maintain as we kind of think about these things, like, all right, look, the numbers seem scary, but they're not actually the numbers. And when you get down to it, and I don't want to get partisan here, uh, if you look at percentage of the population that's hardcore extreme right wing in the country, it's about 18%. Um, and it gets significantly less hardcore to the bottom line. So we always kind of need to maintain that, think about it. I think it's just calmly responding um, to, and you know, really it's a personal fight. You have to kind of turn and talk to the people who are in your own network if you have that crazy uncle at Thanksgiving. What's that? It's about, about, you know, theories. Um, it's it's being able to kind of arm yourself with a set of facts and just kind of stay calm. People really do, and I, I was saying this to them, one of the, one of the issues is people kind of have kind of taken social media and they've replaced. Everybody wants to feel like they're doing something, right? That they're, they're on the right side of history and they've made some difference. And people have kind of taken their social media activity, and it's a very cheap, easy way for them to feel like, mm, I posted about that. But how can you have them like be a major contractor for the U.S. military if he's constantly undermining? Well, yeah, I mean, like, separate the, separate the man from the business. Okay. I mean, that's a longer longer conversation. And actually, there's an argument to be made. I show if he's not watching because I'm destroyed by it or something. But and Elon's really just a, an entrepreneur. He's not the genius engineer. He just hires people who can do what he needs to do. It's certainly what he's saying is destructive and stupid. Uh, I have a family member who won't get into the connections there, but he basically said Elon right now looks like a 17 year old that's just discovered politics for the first time. <laughs> and, you know, he's like, ah. And I remember at 17, believing the idea that the federal government's hiding UFOs. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, like, they could trust me, they can't, they could find anything. Um, but yeah, I, I think you just need to kind of bear that in mind. So, and I think that's more of a US question. Yeah, in general, we need to talk, you know, we need to talk, we need to speak. It's the same about the war prisoners, for example. There is a big action that uh, we are organizing as well, we're co organizing uh, as the Ukrainian NGO, also UA Future. It calls Nemelchi. Don't be silent. Also, if we will talk about our experience, I remember. Uh, at the beginning of the full scale invasion, I was, I told you, I was very um, annoyed about the questions. But later on, I understood actually this is not the people's fault to don't know the facts. This is my fault that I'm not telling them my experience. That's why we are here. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for your. Uh for everything that you do and uh, for your uh, message that you try to deliver to the, to the US audience. I am from uh, Kazakhstan, my name is Maliar. Um, we are also very cautious because we were in the same Budapest Memorandum uh, as Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We're very cautious of what's happening in Ukraine, very uh, for Ukraine, very um, sensitive to what's happening in the country. Uh, two things that, that come across to my mind is, one is the battleground for the hearts of the people in the east of Ukraine, mm -hmm. because you mentioned one woman, she wanted to um, to take her, she wants you to take her to the Donetsk people, people's heroic of Donetsk, so-called, which is like shocking to every one of us, and she's like, 
why would you take the place where no law, no supply, no anything? Mm -hmm. If you have an alternative, even when war torn, but still Ukraine. Um, how many of these people are there? And how effective is Russian propaganda, Russian propaganda on them? Even like bomb for people who, whose house, whose neighbors are bombed, and they still want to join this, um, uh, I don't know, thing called People's mm -hmm. Republic. And the second is like, uh, even in Colombia, like people at Jeffrey Sachs, they come out and say, but we want peace, but we want like, we want all those good things. And they use the good causes of peace, of making you know, friends, of being fair to Putin, even I know it sounds ridiculous, but they use these good causes to justify just seeding Ukraine to, to, into Putin's insatiable mouth, right? What's your argument towards them and how would you oppose them? And how do you think we as you know pro Ukrainian pro Ukrainian people should oppose them? Uh, uh, definitely I don't know the numbers to um, how many people is there, but you can probably count it uh, the same as I counted this with up the forty thousand people before the war, thousand five hundred decide to stay. And probably it's very similar in every city. In Bakhmut, there were about 100,000 people living in the city and about 10,000 decided to stay. Uh, and they've been waiting for the uh, Russian mirror. Yeah. So maybe it will be about 10%, but I don't I don't know the numbers mm. at all. And about if, if, if the propaganda is effective, it is very effective. It is very effective because this war could happen. You know, the world allowed uh, Russia, and it's allowing still Russia, to do the terrorist attacks and murder people every day, every single day. You know, people are dying every single day from the missiles. How this is possible in the 21st century? That you can just attack other country, ruin the cities, thousands of kilometers of the land but burned, a lot of children got killed, women raped, you know. Uh, the, many of men has to die at the front line. You know, how this is possible, how we can allow them to do anything from it. You know, I, I can't understand. But Jessica Aro, my friend, she was she wrote this book, People to Put in Stroll. And uh, now she's writing uh, another book. Probably she won't kill me if I will say it, but uh, <laughs> uh, she did a huge research about uh, Russian propaganda from the 50s of the 20th century, and she found the documents in Berlin uh, saying that uh, it was actually KGB plan in the 50s already, you know, to uh, destroy the West, the Western countries, by propaganda. Uh, but their plan in the 50s was to start from internal propaganda. Internal propaganda was the most important for Russia. And as you probably see after the uh, Carlson interview, for example, uh, Russia is mostly playing on internal, internal propaganda because this is the most important that you have your people supporting you, you know, to murder another nation. So this, uh, this propaganda uh, is very effective. And these people living on the Eastern Ukraine, they've been under this propaganda for years, for years. Even my good friends who are Ukrainian patriots, you know, at the beginning of the war, I've been asking them, like, why you didn't destroy all these uh, Soviet monuments? in your country as we did in Poland. And he couldn't understand why I'm asking about it, you know? And he said, like, this, this is a part of our history. And I said, like, this is not your history. This is the Russian history. My uh, my girlfriend, uh, she's Ukrainian. And uh, she also uh, asked me, like, have you been watching the Soviet movies? And I said, why should I watch the Soviet movies? And like, what's the reason to watch uh, So this is. It was the lifestyle for a long time, and uh, Ukraine was uh, for a few hundred years. They 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 couldn't be free, you know. And the Soviet Union, I think that's my opinion only. I think Soviet Union gave uh, something to Ukrainians that no one gave them before. 
to be proud of being a part of the system and they could be very high in this system as well. They, they could make a career, you know, very huge career in the Soviet Union, you know, and it was, uh, I can say, it was impossible during Polish occupation, they call it, yeah, as well in, in Ukraine. It was impossible to for Ukrainians to work as a with the rail, with the trains, for example, they, they couldn't get a better, better work. So that's why, you know, it's it's very complicated mm, and the long answer probably why this propaganda is effective, but it is. I actually think uh, going along with the figure he left, I'll always have this memory. We were we were doing food drops um, around the villages around Limon, which was liberated, what, November 20. 23, give or take, 22, give or take. So, yeah, and, and I'll always remember this, getting out of the car, and usually I'm there, and I have uh, something that clearly identifies me as an American. And uh, this, this guy came out, he's wearing probably old Russian army camo, and he's bare-chested. He's probably two years older than me, but he looks 70. And uh, on one pack, he has a tiger tattoo, and in the other pack, he's got Vladimir Lenin. <laughs> and so he's, and he was basically, thinks, I don't speak any of the language whatsoever so i have my translator here um but he was repeatedly once he found out i was american uh he was would not let go of my hands and it wasn't because it was like oh thank you america for being here it was more like you need to go back and tell them everything that putin's been justifying for the war is all bs this man was russian married to ukraine one so i think actually russia's done a lot of the work in a way when you start dropping bombs on people they sometimes change their minds so in that regard, as for the Jeffrey Sachs uh, comment earlier, how do you fight against that? I don't want to hit him on his own home turf. Um, do it, man. Okay. Yeah, he's not here. He's not here. Um, <laughs> he's got lots of things that people don't like. Listen, it's the same, same principle with Tucker Carlson. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to imply that Jeffrey Sachs takes money from anybody, but certainly you kind of pursue your audience. Um, so... When we look at Tucker Carlson today, and people have been like, how can somebody have done this? It's like, because you lost your platform and you're pursuing wherever you're going to actually, in Tucker's case, it's a revenue stream. Um, same thing with the uh, Scott Ritter, former UN weapons inspector, if those, those of you who remember him. Um, he is uh, very pro Z. Uh, he's got a presence on the channel. And <clears throat> maybe it is a point where you repeat it enough, you start believing it yourself. But, but those people always be out there because we do live in a free speech society, it's really on all of us, right? So, and it is it turning the tide against those kinds of people. It, it's really done on a personal level with the people that you know uh, in conversation. Because I've actually had plenty of conversations with people who have inquired from the critiques of sending aid to Ukraine. And, and if you have the facts and you kind of spit it back, you can actually watch a little bit of it. Oh, okay, maybe that's not right what I heard. Otherwise, you, you can't shut it down as much as maybe we'd like to. But, um, we're always going to have people like that in this kind of society. It's just part of it. It's a feature of it. They just have a bigger, more loud platform. So, sorry, you were going to. Okay, one more question, and this will be the final question. Yes. Thank you both for the work you're doing. It's very impressive and very risky. Um, given that the armed forces of Ukraine are very overstretched uh, fighting this war, um, what are the measures you think they could take to better protect civilians and better coordinate with groups like yours in order to ensure people are brought to safety? We need to end this war, and then we will be fine. But uh, what to do to, to make our... Better coordination between mm -hmm. AFU and, and all the NGOs for humanitarian and protective studies. Very good question, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, we are cooperating quite well. Maybe that's why I don't know, because at the beginning, there have been thousands of volunteers, thousands of journalists, journalists uh, working in Ukraine. And now I have a feeling sometimes that I know everyone already, you know, and uh, for the last uh, couple of months when I was in Donbass, I was only one international foreign journalist, you know, being there. There was no one except me. Uh, all of the mm, groups uh, working at the front lines, on the front lines, the volunteers groups, actually cooperate together. 
more or less, but we are cooperating, we are helping each other. At the base of it all, he's, he's got a very much a point, but we're not the ones that can necessarily um, impact protecting civilians. What it comes down to is 60 million of aid, 33.1 billion of which stays inside the United States, purchases the means to deploy because the sheer fact is Russia targets civilian infrastructure. You never, unless you can put up an iron dome type, type environment, it comes down to the best way is for everybody in this room, if you are so inclined to continue the pressure of friends, family, talking to representatives to get this support through, because that's what will protect the civilian lives. So. Well, uh, thank you. As, as somebody who's uh, worked in Ukraine and, and feels so much horror and sadness, I really respect the work you're doing and thank you for continuing to do it. Um, and thank you to everyone who came today. Um, let's give them a, a round of applause. Thank you very much.